So thanks for everybody uh, for coming. I appreciate um, you taking the time. This is a really busy evening downtown, so um, I appreciate that you're all here. Um, I do have notes, so I am going to be reading from them. Um, so thanks for um, the incredible staff here at the museum. This has been a, a super fun week um, installing this, this show. Um, I also wanted to shout out that this work was made possible in part um, by a project grant from the Rasmussen Foundation. And I also received a grant from the Sustainable Arts Foundation. Um, and that foundation specifically grants um, and supports artists and writers who have children. So we need more of those. Um, and because I'm married to an architect who's here, who's had the privilege of working on several Alaskan museums and libraries, um, including this one. We, um, like Jackie said, we attended this museum's last Friday event in 2014, before the old museum closed. And uh, then we were here again for the grand opening in 2016, I think that's right. Um, and I wasn't raised in or around museums but I'm always thrilled to say that my children have been, not just experiencing the art side, but whether they realize it or not, they get to experience a little bit of the back of house as well. So there they are. So I've lived in Alaska for 18 years. <laughs> I know, he's not, he's, he's still pretty cute, but I mean, look at that. <laughs> So I've lived in Alaska for 18 years, and I'm a mother of two, and I work from a studio in my basement in Anchorage. And it's not a fancy space, but it's a serviceable situation that allows me to roll out of bed, um, sometimes at five in the morning or sometimes earlier, and get an hour and a half of work done before the rest of the family wakes up. Well, except for Brian, because he gets up at four, four or five or three or... You know. <laughs> So, but I do have a lot of gratitude about um, being able to work from home. And I also um, have a lot of fabric in that basement. So I work with textiles, creating wall work, sculpture, and installation. My art practice explores the work of women. My raw material is their literal work, old embroidery, domestic linens, much of it discarded or unfinished. And the living questions that I pour into my art arise from this handwork, but also revolve around the work of the body, birth, death, sex, labor, and the deeper emotional work of women. This is a narrow, deep well to pull from, and to have defined what I do in such a way may seem limiting, but within the confines of that well, I have incredible freedom. So tonight I'm going to share background from the body of work which makes up this solo exhibition and I'll also share a bit of the process. The Inheritance Project started in 2015 as a small crowdsourcing campaign to collect vintage linens. I did this officially for 13 months but I still get things in the mail. This effort created a small embracing community and became the catalyst, it became the raw material for the body of work exhibited here in Gallery 2. The solo exhibition showed this summer at the Anchorage Museum as well, and they intend to travel it through 2020. Despite this feeling like a complete project with a beginning, middle, and an end, it's still that deep thematic well I'm bumping around in. But before I get to that project, all those piles of doilies and embroideries and stories. I want to share some personal history with you, which will provide a deeper insight into why I do what I do. <clears throat> so I come from a family of Swedish makers. My position in this family is the 12th firstborn daughter to a firstborn daughter. These are credentials that stretch back to 1640. This is the only photograph I have of four firstborn daughters, four generations, and the little one in the middle. 
Um, that's my mom <laughs> on the side, the hot, the hot Swede. So I was taught to sew by my Swedish mother, who was taught by her grandmother, who's here on the end, um, her mother and her aunts. And I see this as an inherited skill passed on to me in a certain way which was very Scandinavian and has a certain PTSD quality to it. <laughs> but like anything inherited, there comes a point where you have to make that thing your own. I learned to embroider and crochet when I was three or four, run a sewing machine when I was nine, and was reduced to tears at every turn, sobbing often, I don't know how to do this. And my mother would get really frustrated and say, of course you don't know how to do it yet, I haven't even showed you. But this is what I understood, the perfection of it all. The back of a project had to look as beautiful as the front. Crooked stitches had to be ripped out and re-sewn, and learning how to run a sewing machine was a nightmare. First we had to clean the machine, then we had to oil it, and then we had to organize all the presser feet, and then we had to wind a bobbin, and then change the needle, and then I got to sew a straight stitch. But it wasn't ever straight. It wasn't a perfect 5 8 inch seam allowance. So then I had to learn about the seam ripper. I love my mother, but I just wanted to sew. She also always referred to this mysterious teacher. She would say, if your teacher saw this, she would make you redo it. <laughs> if you show this to your teacher, she would ask you why it wasn't finished, why the seam allowance was all wobbly. I'm like, who the hell is this teacher? <laughs> so she was my teacher, so it was really confusing and sometimes a horrible learning experience. And I probably would have quit sewing altogether, <laughs> except for <laughs> prom. <laughs> <laughs> so, so this is some hardcore Nevada desert street cred from 1987. <laughs> and some more from 1988. I know, the hair was so 80s. And some more from 1989. That's from the Reno Gazette Journal. And while I loved the end result, I loved the act of sewing even more. I made incredible dresses for myself and for friends. And because of this, I received a high school internship in a small atelier making costumes and wedding gowns when I was 17. And when they hired me at $5 an hour, I thought I'd full on arrived on the fashion scene. But it was Reno, so I had kind of arrived. <laughs> um, this is me in 1999. I cut all that hair off. So I worked in Reno um, while I was completing two undergraduate degrees at UNR. One was in art and one was in textiles. And I remained in the clothing industry for 12 years. The last seven years were in Vancouver, British Columbia, which is where this was taken, this picture, where I worked as a production seamstress, a sample sewer, a production cutter, a pattern drafter, a pattern grader, a production manager, a draper, a fit model, a consultant, and a designer. At one job, I received nine bounced paychecks. But I didn't leave because there was always a line of fresh fashion design students, graduates, um, poised to take that position. And there weren't a lot of jobs. And I thought I could stick it out. And there was a volume of other stories associated with this time, which I won't go into. But just know that by age 30, I'd burned out and I needed to make a drastic change. So that's pretty drastic. <laughs> this was last summer in Prince William Sound. Um, in 2000, we moved to Alaska. And like many people who come here, I reinvented myself. I even changed my signature. I completed an MFA in creative writing at UAA, and over the course of 10 years, I worked as a freelance illustrator, and I published 12 books for children. And during that time, I became a mother. And my son broke that line of firstborn daughters, which is a good thing, since that child would have been the 13th 
firstborn daughter to a firstborn daughter, and that sounds pretty unlucky. We've created our own family culture inspired by place and inspired by institutions. For example, the exhibition Gyre, the Plastic Ocean, that it was at the Anchorage Museum a few years ago, was such a call to arms for my children who want to save all the animals that we now clean beaches every summer in Prince William Sound. It's a culture that believes everything deserves to be left better than the way we found it, that things, animals, and people need rescue and reconsideration, and this land we stand on is the greatest thing our children inherit. So this is that piece that Jackie mentioned from 2013, and I'm showing it to you because motherhood became the catalyst for a second reinvention. Um, I found caring for young children lonely and challenging, but when I was at my lowest emotionally, I gathered what felt like every life experience I'd ever had to that point. Designer, writer, seamstress, artist, mother, illustrator, child, woman, and poured it into a new form. This piece is called Spontaneous Combustion, which is not only a reference to the concept my son was trying to understand at age four or five, after he slipped a penny behind a nightlight in the hallway, where it fused onto the prongs and sent a stream of black smoke up the wall and sparks, and I was in the shower when that happened. But Spontaneous Combustion was also the reference to who I was as a woman conflicted about motherhood and the inability to express myself creatively at that time. The whimsy and lightness I'd had as a children's book illustrator had left me. This piece is an act of mourning that loss, but also an act of reincarnation and rebirth. Spontaneous combustion is now in the permanent collection at the Anchorage Museum, which is something I'm really proud of, but mostly that acquisition made the fact that I cut up all the family linens a little more tolerable <laughs> for my mother. But what's important about this piece is that unlike the uninterrupted time I never had for writing, unlike the precision and speed and whimsy I ironically could no longer muster for children's book illustration, needlework felt like the one thing I could accomplish with children at my feet. I could put it aside for a few minutes or a few days or even months, I began to understand the history of handwork and women, not because I read about it or saw it, but because I was living it. I could be angry while doing this work. I could be pleased. I could be fulfilled. I could be portable. I could be still. I could consider the 11 other firstborn daughters who had likely done exactly the same thing since 1640. So here's how this project, the Inheritance Project, started with a blog post in 2015 based on the very first box someone sent to me. It's a short blog post, I'll read it to you, but it, like spontaneous combustion, this was an important catalyst for a new phase in my creative life. A woman I have never met whose face I've never seen, who lives in a place I've never traveled to, just sent me a box. When she contacted me to ask if she could do such a thing, I told her, no anthrax, no firebombs. She sent pointy vintage brassieres instead. And a pair of stockings with seams up the back and the cardboard tag still fastened. Textiles with the scent of storage and story and life and mystery. My girl and I opened the box tried some things on. Of course, my son and his friend, two nine-year-old boys, spied on us through the window, and we caught them laughing at us. <laughs> this glimpse of what's to come is nothing any boy could understand, whether or not he sees it with his own eyes. It is the mystery of womanhood and of women, past, present, future, of their bodies and lives, their ideals of beauty and hopes, their attempts to save the very best for some occasion that never comes. Tags still intact. It may have been one of the purest moments I have ever spent with my girl. I don't know what I will do with these items. Maybe something, maybe nothing. But when my child tests me and pushes me and fights me and when we hurt each other unintentionally, 
I will conjure this afternoon, the day before first grade, sorry, <laughs> and open the box again. I will not be authority in that moment, and she will not be tyrant. Our teeth will not be bared. We'll stop saving the very best of each other for some special time, and instead be our best right then. Neither one of us will wield power. To move toward the unknown with another person is the ultimate equalizer. So thank you, dear friend, from far away. I know you thought you were sending items to a person who may find them useful, and I may. But the greater gift for me was an Alaskan afternoon in the waning days of summer, answering questions, asking questions, and holding time in my hands before it skips away. After that blog post went out, I was contacted by many, many other people, mostly women, who also had items they wanted to send me, things they wanted to say. And it soon became clear that if I didn't put a shape around this thing, it was going to get out of control. Over the course of 13 months, I received hundreds of handmade cloth objects from, I wrote here, over 70 people, but really it was over 80, I think, in the end. Family linens, doilies, embroideries, the origins of which represent 20 countries and half the states. This box came from an artist in France. It was so beautifully presented that I called a friend over and we spent two hours opening each little crinkly parcel and reading all the tags and swooning over her broken English and heartfelt descriptions. Contributors expressed relief at finally having someone to pass these items and narratives on to. I photographed and documented all of this in a series of 30 blog posts, and the cloth became the raw material for this exhibition, Inheritance, Makers, Memory, and Myth. And during this time of listening and correspondence, I came to understand a solid sense of self and a deep understanding in relationship to materials. Does every artist need to have this deep connection to materials? Of course not, but for me it's been vital. And while the community that arose from the Inheritance Project provided me with narrative and raw material, it also provided validation and expectation. Two actions artists often assume should come from galleries or collectors or institutions, but don't have to and generally won't. This community arose by reaching out to a specific group of people Women with linens they couldn't keep, but also couldn't discard. We both had needs, and we both could fulfill them for one another. Initially, I was looking for raw material. They were looking for a place to send doilies and embroideries other than the goodwill or the landfill. And in the end, there were a lot of people with skin in the game who were waiting to see what I would do. So that's some history, and here's some process. I know I'm curious about the creative process. It gives me deeper insight into other artists' and writers' work, and it informs my own creative process to know that I'm not alone in that struggle. A concept I remind myself of all the time is what writer Brett Lott calls the not knowing. The not knowing is that desolate process-bound place where all you have to rely on is yourself. I, however, had something else I could rely on while completing this body of work, the materials, and the fact that in this case they kept right on coming. For me, the answers to the not knowing only arrive from the act of doing, showing up, but in chair. So this is my version of a blank canvas, rendered slightly less scary by the fact that someone else has already marked on it, or even stained it, and slightly more frustrating because some parameters have already been established. I maintain that relationship to these materials because they've been part of my life in some form since I was born. But this doesn't mean I love them. I admire the work that went into them and someone's drive to complete them, or maybe even more so the defiance to leave them unfinished. But I don't live with doilies underneath every lamp or on every table in my home. And I'm married to an architect. You can't have doilies and things like that. <laughs> And I'm completely frustrated by the mountain of discarded and generally useless women's handwork that exists in the world. It says so much about how little we value this work, how little we value the domestic realm. 
What I do love though, is that without fail, these items create an emotional response in me. Whether it's interest, repulsion, sadness, or hope, I'm always drawn to them. I connect these materials to my environment, to memory, to the present, to possibility. I connect them to conflict because it's my own conflicted relationship to this material and to the women in my family who made similar items that propels the emotion I drive into it. This is a piece called Snowblind in Process, and it wasn't going to be called this until I threw it out onto the deck out of frustration one day because something about it and up until that point had been too perfect or too clean and that deeper narrative kept dancing around the edges. And after I saw the work in the snow, it became clear what I needed to do. So I covered the hours of embroidery that I'd already completed with a swath of more embroidery, like sweeping a paint-loaded brush across the surface in order to convey the conflict I was feeling. I thought about avalanches and beacons, about being blinded by brightness, suffocated by snow. The origin of Snowblind was based on an incident between my children. Astrid was maybe four and got angry with her older brother, stomped off and shut herself in the coat closet, and after a few minutes began calling, now you come find me, come find me, come find me. But he didn't. <laughs> He'd moved on to another part of the house or some other game, so he never opened the door. <laughs> and he never came for her. And I'm not faulting him, because he was like six. But this male-female interaction felt so uncomfortably familiar and so adult. Our home, a microcosm for the world of relationships my children would be entering into, blindly even, a training ground for the interactions and responses they'll trade with their partners the squabbles they'll be too stubborn or too proud to smooth over. I worked on the center of this piece on and off for two years, on road trips, on airplanes, on boat trips, thinking about relationships and blindness and our interactions with others. I thought about the ways we want to be comforted and how we want to be found. This piece is a perfect example of patience and urgency, two vital and frustrating components of any art practice. It's also a good example of not knowing but still showing up. It also sold to a collector in Los Angeles a few months ago, who graciously allowed it to show here before receiving it. So don't touch it. <laughs> so a process that emerged during the course of this project was the very physical act of massing. I was always moving piles or pinning things onto the walls in groups based on color or structure or size. Those are Astrid's arms. She was organizing those potholders by rainbow color. Then I'd rearrange them when something new would arrive in the mail. And I called those mailed packages boxes of mystery because I never knew what was coming. The not knowing forced me to trust myself and the materials. And the sheer amount of some objects felt really fascinating to me in terms of the human drive to make. If your grandmother ever made a pie or a doily or a fuss or a scene, she probably didn't make just one. My Swedish grandmother's doilies were pretty, but her defiant and sometimes pouty scenes were not. So this is a piece called Hysteria. This is in my studio where I have these fabulous walls that I can pin into. Um, it's constructed of pot and cotton pot holders, and they're covered in screaming mouths. So let me be clear, that mouth pattern is not a Joanne fabric store pattern. <laughs> but I'm a pattern maker. So this is how those mouth forms began, with soft sculpture and pattern drafting. There are seven pattern pieces in each mouth form. And they were transferred from felt, which you saw previous to this, to cardstock, and then used to cut out embroidered linens and layered batting. So there's an entire hidden structure inside of each completed mouth. 
I made uh, three samples and I tweaked the pattern just a little bit each time. And they look simple, almost like they're emerging from the piece itself. Or maybe it's something familiar. Maybe it's another pot holder. People have looked at it and have said, oh, they look like little shoes or they look like a cradle. Um, but when you make the connection that what you see is a mouth, the piece suddenly has a voice. So here are all those pot holders in the red tones and all the blue ones. And this is Astrid rearranging pot holders on the wall in my studio. Um, I don't have photographs of us installing this piece here, but it looks an awful lot like that. That was at the Anchorage Museum. That's Janet and Maria installing all those pieces. Um, Jackie and Aaron had the two main panels installed when I showed up on Tuesday, and they were uh, maybe relieved and maybe horrified when I said, well, we can just put the little ones up with blue tape on the wall. <laughs> But that's really the only way to place them, and we were able to make it bigger on this wall than it was at the Anchorage Museum. But it's not a race. <laughs> um, this is Hysteria installed at the Anchorage Museum, and here's a little something extra. It's a quote from a book called Body Lore by Catherine Young about Freud, which actually inspired this piece. Um, she writes, Freud expressed an awareness of the disruptive potential of needlework. In clinical studies, he found a correlation between an extremely monotonous existence in a puritanically minded family, needlework, and hysteria. <laughs> needlework makes women prone to daydreaming, prone to excess, to a non-utility that fed the narcissistic self-sufficiency to which some women were always prey. To paraphrase the rest of the section, needlework was, a, was dangerous to a woman's and her family's health because women were given the opportunity to experience their inner selves while creating in a private state to which men had no access. This apparently resulted in everything from faintness to nervousness to lack of sexual desire, to insomnia, to irritability, and a tendency to cause trouble. I mean, clearly, Freud. So often I received stories from contributors that I haven't been able to shake. I keep returning to the narratives, considering elements of fiction or visual ways of coming to a deeper understanding. The piece Panoply is my response to a scrap of crocheted tablecloth that was sent to me, made by a woman named Amelia while incarcerated in the Detroit House of Corrections for killing her abusive husband in the 1970s. The installation is made from 11 mid-century crocheted dress-shaped potholders that never protected a woman's hand, ever, based on all that open crochet work. They are saturated with adhesives and acrylic medium and acrylic paint um, and stitched over with leftover wool from 1970s embroidery kits. I would just take a length of pre-cut wool, thread on it a uh, needle, and sew and sew and sew until I got to the end and then leave the needle stabbed in it. This is an homage to the needles stabbed into many of the unfinished embroideries I received. So the definition of a panoply is a collection of things, but an older definition refers to a complete suit of armor or complete protection for spiritual warfare. These small dresses are my response to the living questions around the ways women protect themselves, sometimes with meager resources. These are hardened exoskeletons about the size of a human heart. So we're on the home stretch, guys. So here's um, just a little bit of nitty gritty. I do use a sketchbook, but only for initial ideas and lists. Um, the problem solving is generally worked out with the cloth itself and the many components that need to come together to form a narrative. I often work in the quilt form, and a lot of people have a quilt story. Quilts are a maternal symbol of being cared for and loved. 
The irony is I don't have a quilt story from my childhood. That is because there is no Swedish woman in my family ever who thought it was a good idea to cut up perfectly good fabric and then sew it all back together again. <laughs> that is not a thing. So I grew up with embroidery and crochet and garment making and mending, but not quilting. I come to it with a fascination for the form instead of a reverence or a nostalgia. I don't call myself an art quilter or a quilt artist or a quilter. In some part of me, this kind of defining also remains not a thing. But it's a form I explore because I want people to approach my work with attention. Viewers know what this is. Either the form or the components are familiar. It's layered. They want to touch it, wrap up in it. I saw people touching things all over in the gallery despite Jackie's little cards that said, do not touch the artwork. But you can't help it. <laughs> and so if you're like me, you have to jam your hands in your pockets when you look at textile work. If you're a maker, you want to flip things over and look at the back and see how they're constructed. And yet there's something unsettling about the work I do, something dark, either figuratively or literally. Um, I see textile work as a way to confront a viewer without being confrontational. This piece is called Mater Familius, which is Latin for the word matriarch. The eyes are my grandmother's eyes, judging. The small house embroideries are a nod to the many houses imprinted on vintage embroidery kits, but also indicate entrapment within the domestic realm and the cycle of emotional abuse occurring between women, specifically. In ways, it's my mother's story. When she left Sweden in 1965, she broke another very specific familial line. Top layer of this piece is constructed with three colors of French seamed silk organza, then layered over an abandoned hand-sewn quilt top with doilies embedded between the two layers. This piece is a good example of the balance between the workmanship of certainty versus the workmanship of risk. I take a lot of risks, but I pre-plan them. I use tailors and dressmaking techniques in all of my work because that's what I know. I based an applique and quilt by hand. I let things hang and stretch rather than wrangling them into compliance. To me, fabric is a living thing, responding to heat, humidity, time, and weight. And generally, there's a hidden structure inside. I back all of my cloth with other cloth, and this gives it body in a thicker hand without the stiffness and long-term uncertainty of fusible adhesives. These eye pieces are all numbered so I could keep them straight. The inside of my work is like an archeological dig. So that's inheritance, or I'm uh, sorry, Mater Familius hanging in the Anchorage Museum. Like I said, it's not a race. I think it looks really different in this gallery. So the last piece I want to share with you is the collaborative art project called Needle and Myth. Participants embroidered a word or a phrase which completed the prompt she is or she was and embedded an object between the layers of cloth. That's a little bit of Freud's trouble being embroidered right there. This woman who's, who's making this piece um, made this one for her mother, who was trouble, because apparently she sometimes stole things, but just a little bit. <laughs> but that's, that's why the trouble is so small, she said. So this small, intimate act was a way of holding a woman in our thoughts for a full two hours then combining all of these memories to create a complex, complete mythology, a fuller picture of all the ways a woman can exist in reality and in memory. 72 people, women, men, and children completed 80 embroidered silk and linen panels. And I received these handkerchiefs from contributors all over the world. One woman sent me 37 that she'd been collecting for 20 years. One family of participants, a young daughter, a mother, and a grandmother, created panels that represented the memory of four generations of women, which is just gorgeous to me. There is a long history of needlewomen working together to create something that's more than the sum of its parts, a long history of community, of making, of self-care. 
When I first started the Inheritance Project, I felt strongly that since I couldn't reimburse people for all their shipping costs, some people boxed up linens and spent $80 shipping them to me, and they were happy to do it. But I thought I would write a lovely card and make a teeny tiny doily to send to them. And I was really happy about this decision until I'd made over 80 of them. I, made, I had a lot of spreadsheets and because the administration of this project was enormous, but it felt vital to keep organized. I didn't know what information I would need later because I didn't know what this project would become. This deeper dive gave me insight to the way an inheritance can tear a family apart or leave them burdened, but I also saw all the ways it can be a comfort, a reminder of how much we were loved. We inherit fortunes and legacies, physical traits and skills. We inherit temperaments that skip generations, and all of this comes with an emotional residue associated with memory, objects, or with the face looking back at us in the mirror. Inheritance reminds us of loss, of ghosts. It's something both terrible and beautiful, tangible, but not ours for very long. Thank you for listening. Oh, I'm super happy to answer any questions if anybody has any. I don't think you have to use the mic if that feels scary. <laughs> Does anybody have any questions? I'm curious about the children's books. Oh, about the children's books? <laughs> I mean, they're available and all that, and they're out there somewhere. They're out there somewhere, yeah. So some of them are still in print. One of them is not. But yeah, I did chapter books and picture books. I had a publisher in Canada and um, a publisher in Portland. Thank you. Yeah. You still need more adventure. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm not like actively crowdsourcing vintage linens, but I never say no. <laughs> I am currently working on um, a body of work that looks at motherhood and um, birth. Um, I'm considering the tools around birth. So um, I have a piece in the Anchorage Museum right now in the um, All Alaska Biennial, which will be coming here. And the piece is called Birth Rope. And it is made of discarded marine rope that I found uh, in Prince William Sound, and it is also using um, discarded vintage linens to create kind of a tool. Um, it doesn't, it's not clear as what, to what the specific use is, but I'm, I'm thinking about um, the spiritual tools that women pull from within themselves in order to give birth or prepare to give birth. So, um, so that's what that piece is about. And I'm also looking at um, being a mother and being an artist at the same time. So work around motherhood. Still using vintage linens. Still, <laughs> I have a lot of vintage linens that I'm still using. So I think there was a question over here. It was the same question. Oh, it was. OK. You can come up to me afterwards, and <laughs> I'll give you my card. <laughs> You'll get a little teeny, teeny, tiny doily in the mail. <laughs> Everybody should have a doily. If you give them all to me, then you have none, right? <laughs> I think that woman came up to me at the Anchorage Museum. I had never met her, but we had been corresponding. And she had sent me, you'll see there's a couple of red doilies. So if somebody sent a second box, then they got a red doily. I know. So she came up to me, and she had made earrings out of her doilies. <laughs> She had one white one and one red one. <laughs> it's hilarious. And another woman put her little doily on her keys and always had it in her hand. And it was really dirty. You know, it was soiled from her hand and from her keys. But she always had it with her. I thought it was really sweet. <laughs> Anybody else have any questions? Well, thank you so much for listening. <laughs> Appreciate your time. Thank you.